Well, I don't claim to be much of a historian, but I do recall being uh, fascinated when I first learned about the beginning of World War I when I was in junior high. Uh, World War I, you know, it started when one man and his wife were assassinated. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated with his wife in uh, Sarajevo by a Bosnian Serb on June 28th of 1914 in the summertime. Now, uh, Archduke Ferdinand was the heir to the throne of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. It was a pretty big land mass at that point in time. And within the span of just two weeks, the German Empire, which was much greater in land mass at that point in time, was pulled into the fight, as well as Russia. In the span of one month from that point in time, at late, late June 1914, both France and Britain had taken their sides and entered the war. Eventually, within the year, Japan had entered the war. They're not even close to Europe, and they entered the war. They attacked and took over the Marshall Islands, which were at that time controlled by the nation of Germany. If you can believe it, the African nations began fighting too. Much, uh, much of the reason had to do with uh, several of those African countries were German colonies at that point in time. It took a little bit longer for countries in the Western Hemisphere to fight, but eventually the United States took sides as well. Cuba, Panama, Brazil, Nicaragua, even Haiti, these countries entered the war. China entered the war as well. Nearly every country in the world was involved in the war directly or affected in some way or another before the war was over. And it all started with the assassination of one man and his wife in one corner of the world. The escalation of the war happened very swiftly. Uh, as you can imagine, as I was going through the countries that joined the war, within the span of weeks, nations were being uh, pulled in, when beforehand, everything was fine. And unforeseen alliances had formed too. Unforeseen enemies were made at that point in time. Nobody could have really predicted this kind of event would have happened in the way that it did when one man and one woman were assassinated. From this historical example, we can see that a worldwide change can happen unexpectedly and in a very, very quick manner. And this example happened a hundred years ago, one century, even more than a hundred years ago, when they didn't have technology to send missiles halfway around the world in a minute, when it took uh, much more effort to communicate between different parties. Things happen so much more rapidly now uh, with the advanced travel and uh, uh, technology that we have available. Now, the Bible tells us that conditions in the world we live in now will change in very rapid and dramatic ways in the not too distant future. It takes less and less imagination these days to see how prophecy can be fulfilled. As we go through the update, we read the articles about the current events, about what's happening, and everything that we publish fits into some piece of prophecy that comes from the Bible. It doesn't take much imagination to see things move into place. It is our responsibility to understand what to watch for so that we are not deceived when these events actually begin to take place. And that, in large part, is why we publish the types of articles that we do in the update that we send out every week. It's for your benefit. It's for my benefit. It's for creating awareness of the world around us in light of the biblical prophecy. Now, uh, the beginning of sorrows describes a time that leads up to the Great Tribulation. 
And I will uh, take some time today to cover the events that are prophesied to occur during this time called the beginning of sorrows to help us understand what to watch for as the beginning of the end approaches. It is the early stages of prophetic fulfillment that I want to make sure that we understand. I won't go beyond the tribulation. There's much, much, much more that happens after that point in time, but I want to focus on the things that happen at the early stages today. But knowing what the Bible tells us will happen is just half of our responsibility. We are supposed to study it. We are supposed to understand it. But we also need to know what to do about it. There will be many things that happen that are far out of our control, that we will not be able to do anything about. Prophetic events will happen, they will change the world around us, and we will have no effect on their occurring whatsoever. But what can we control is the question that I want to look into. What does the Bible tell us that we are to actually do with the knowledge that we have? So there will be two parts to this sermon. The first part will be about the events that will happen that precede the tribulation. And the second part will answer the question of what can we do about it? So let's open up our Bibles to Revelation 6. And I'll begin uh, reading verses 1 and 2. So I'll start out by going back and forth in, in large part between uh, some verses here in Revelation 6 and in Matthew 24. They are very parallel. There are four seals that are opened at the beginning of the sorrows, which line up with uh, what Jesus Christ prophesied would happen in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Matthew 24. So Revelation 6, beginning in verse 1, this is about the first seal that's opened. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a great white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now this is the first uh, horseman of the apocalypse, as we have coined that term. I guess we haven't coined that term. That term has been coined. We, that's how we understand this. And uh, as we understand it, this is about religious deception. And we will go uh, over to Matthew to show uh, that in a moment. But here we see that there is a man on this horse, which is, uh, you know, who is carrying a bow and who has a crown. Now, this is a false depiction of Jesus Christ. He has a bow and a crown. But the real depiction of Christ is much different. And I want to uh, turn over to Revelation 19 and read verses 11 through 16 that describes something very similar. Just as we have a white horse with a man on it, in Revelation 6, we also have, have a, a man on a horse in Revelation 19, in verses 11 through 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on, it, on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with the robe dripped in, dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his name uh, and on his thigh a name written, King of King, Lord of Lords. This is the real depiction of Jesus Christ. He also is on a white horse. 
He has many crowns. His weapon is not a bow. It is the sword, the word of God. And his actual return occurs after the tribulation begins. Now some, as we're on this topic of religious deception, some will falsely say that Jesus Christ will return before the tribulation. That's not what the Bible says. That contradicts biblical teaching. Some, thinking about this concept of religious deception, and probably many, many more from what we uh, can understand from the Bible, many people will say that Jesus will delay his coming or that he will not return. But we need to know when he will return. So uh, let's go over to Matthew 24 and read verse 5. You can keep a, a, mark, a bookmark here in Revelation 6. We'll be turning back to it. Matthew 24 and verse 5 states this. For many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ and will deceive many. I'll take a moment here to think about this in the context of religious deception. Now this, we see that there will be many declaring that Jesus is the Christ. Now this can include, but is definitely not limited to individuals proclaiming that they are the Christ. But false teachers will also say that Jesus is the Christ, but will not abide by true doctrine. Most Christian religions today, nominal Christian religions, fulfill this description. They will say Jesus' name over and over again, but they do not abide by the commandments. That's religious deception. Now, I uh, wrote about, uh, or actually we read about Matthew 24 and verse 5, of course. Uh, but what I would like to do is uh, start at the beginning of Matthew 24, just to give you a context of Jesus' uh, teaching here. So this is about uh, you know, Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple and explaining what will happen. Uh, to his disciples. Matthew 24 and verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left uh, here upon another. That shall not be thrown down. In verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So this is the context of which we can uh, see things being uh, described. In verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. This is where the concept of religious deception is introduced by Jesus Christ. We read verse 5, but I'll repeat it. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So this describes in parallel that first seal being opened in Revelation 6. It's religious deception. Turn with me over to Luke 21, and I'll read verse 8. This is also very much uh, parallel to what we read here in Matthew 24. Luke 21 and verse 8. And he said, Take heed that you, may, uh, that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. We are warned that we will hear these words. They may be compelling, but we are not to go after them. It will be said that the time of Christ's return has drawn near, 
And indeed, we proclaim that as well. But we know that Jesus Christ will not return until the tribulation occurs. We need to be on guard against religious deception because it will draw many people away. Now, religious deception, thinking about the sequence of events that happens during the beginning of sorrows, it has taken place for a long period of time. Religious deception we can read about in these pages of the Bible. It began very shortly after the church was established. We don't have to wait for this to begin. It has begun. If we're looking for the signs of the times that mark the beginning of the end, religious deception is here at the doorstep. However, it is apparent that religious deception will become more widespread, more abundant, much stronger and vigorous. This rhetoric uh, will continue. False teachings will become more pronounced and stronger. This is what we can anticipate and watch for. So that describes the first seal, the first part of one of the, be of the beginning of sorrows. Let's go back to Revelation 6 and look at the second step. Revelation 6, beginning in verse 3, and I'll read verse 4 as well. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. This describes peace being taken away from the earth. War, plain and simple, is what uh, we can uh, interpret here as occurring in the world. As we understand this, it says that peace will be taken from the world. That can easily be interpreted, accurately be interpreted, as widespread world war. Just as in World War I and World War II, many nations were dragged into war that seemingly had no relationship to the beginning of that war. At the moment, right now, today, many nations in the world are not at war. That is something that is true. But we certainly have rumors of war. We have threats. But at the moment, for the most part, we have a lot of peace that we enjoy. However, uh, we should not be lulled into a false sense of security. We can see how quickly and easily this can start. World War I started when one man and his wife were assassinated. And how quickly did that escalate? How quickly will a world war escalate when, when there's a spiritual war go going on in heaven? And when this, uh, the end is drawing near? It will happen very, very quickly. The Bible says so. It will sneak up on people. We need to be aware of that. But wars must happen. Uh, turning back to Matthew 24 and verse 6. We can read the next step, the next warning that uh, Jesus Christ tells us his disciples about as they are asking to learn about the signs of the times. Matthew 24 and verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He warns his disciples and he warns us that wars will be fought around the world. They'll be everywhere. We are instructed not to become overwhelmed by this or troubled when it takes place. Don't panic is what he says. It has to happen. There's nothing you can do about these events occurring. And it's going to get much worse is what he says. The end is not yet. Hang on tight. 
is the warning here. People will be extremely frightened. And that includes God's people, I'm sure of it. And they will likely take drastic measures in response to that fear. But those drastic measures are what we are warned against. Hang on tight, is what he says. Turn with me to Luke 21, and we'll read verse 9. Luke 21 and verse 9 speaks again of that uh, parallel occurrence. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Note that the Christian involvement with war here is described as hearing about the wars. Christians are not to fight in wars. It does not say that you will be fighting in wars. It says that you will hear about wars. That's uh, something to take note of. Christians do not fight in wars of this world. But we also see a different word here in Luke 21. The word commotions is used. And this expands beyond the definition of war. And we can imagine that this applies to the concept and occurrence of civil unrest. That will fit into this category as well. How quickly does chaos erupt when a natural disaster hits? How fast does looting occur when something bad happens? Will that happen again? Does that fit into the definition of commotions? It certainly can. And again here, the end, the worst, the tribulation, will not yet have arrived. Things will be really, really bad. But the tribulation still will not have started. When considering war, we should be reminded, again, how quickly things can and will escalate, just as they did in World War I. It will happen again, and it is very safe to say that these wars mentioned in the Bible will take place and begin and erupt and spread on a much, much shorter time scale. So that's the second seal. What's the third? Let's go back over to uh, Revelation 6, and we'll read verses 5 and 6. Revelation 6 and verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of four, the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for denarius, and three quarts of barley for denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is about famine. Food will become very scarce and expensive. It'll still be available, but it will be hard to come by. People will experience malnutrition, starvation, Poverty, certainly. And this is something uh, that, boy, it, it sure is frightening. When you've got mouths to feed, when you need a meal every single day, multiple times a day to stay alive and healthy, you depend on availability of food. How, think about our grocery stores and how much food they have in stock. Here in the United States, we're fortunate enough to see full shelves every single day. They are getting shipments every single day. I think we've seen photographs of places hit by natural disasters where people go into supermarkets and clear the shelves. And that's in a matter of days. These things will happen again. Turn with me back to Luke 21, and we'll uh, read verse 11. Luke 21, and verse 11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. This describes a lot of different events going on here. Uh, famine, this third seal, is mentioned in the context of earthquakes. 
more natural disasters. Those will take place as well. And we're talking about fearful sights here, too. Uh, certainly, when we see chaos erupt, war erupt around the world, those are fearful sights. When we see photographs and video of earthquakes and natural, natural disasters today, those are fearful things to behold. But there will also be great signs from heaven, and these can refer to cosmic disturbances and you know, perhaps uh, destructive uh, meteors uh, hitting the earth. These are the kinds of events that will happen leading up to the tribulation. Again, these are happening before the tribulation begins. Uh, let's go back to Matthew 24 and read verse 7. That parallel account. Matthew 24 and verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Again, here is scarcity of food and natural disasters. This famine is occurring. And these will be natural consequences of war. When war happens, you can read about food rationing uh, that has happened historically, and that is certainly going to happen again. I'll get into the fourth seal here, and we've actually touched on it already a little bit. The fourth seal is this pestilence. Both Matthew and Luke mention famine and pestilence together. And pestilence describes widespread fatal disease epidemics. When food and nourishment become scarce and unavailable, immune systems in our frail human state, those become compromised as well. And something similar actually happened uh, at the end of the First World War. Uh, there was a Spanish flu in 1918 that claimed the lives of somewhere between 20 and 40 million people. It was a massive, massive occurrence. So let's uh, go back to Revelation 6 and read verses 7 uh, and, and 8, opening that fourth seal. Revelation 6, verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by beasts of the earth. Sickness and disease will spread through the earth as well. Did you catch how many people will perish? 25%. If we have almost 9 billion people on the planet right now, that is two and a half, no, two and a quarter billion people dying. That's a lot of people. And that will occur as a result of these events. War, starvation, disease epidemics, and it even mentions wild beasts. It's horrible times that will come. There's a progression that we can see will happen. Religious deception is where it all begins. War and worldwide conflict mark the next major milestone. And what follows from this is the natural escalation. Availability of food will be scarce. Sickness will follow and death as a result. Many people will suffer during this time, but the tribulation will not start until those events occur. Let's go back to Matthew 24. And I will read beginning in verse 8. All right, Matthew 24 and verse 8. And all these 
are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the nations as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So all of these events that occur as these four seals are opened, the religious deception, the war, the famine, the pestilence, these are the beginning of sorrows. And this all happens before the tribulation begins. 25% of the people will die. That's a lot. And it's just the beginning of the end. There will be several events that are prophesied to take place following the beginning of the tribulation as well. Now, if you, a lot of what I've been going through today, uh, you can read about, and I uh, used as a reference point a, a booklet that we have, and that is, uh, uh, paraphrasing the title here, that is uh, prophecy. Uh, uh, prophecy the, from now, uh, the history of man from now until uh, forever. There we go. Thank you. You can see me get embarrassed here a little bit. It's a good booklet. And the contents I'm you know, sharing with you. The title, apparently, I don't remember verbatim. All right, so we know and understanding how uh, these uh, prophetic events in Revelation fit together, that there are seven total seals that describe prophetic events. I've only gone through the first four. There are three more that happen after that. And the seventh seal consists of four, uh, I'm sorry, seven trumpets. And of those seven trumpets, the seventh consists of seven bowls of wrath. And in each one of those events, there's a lot of stuff that happens. And I've only covered just the beginning. So just when people will see that these events in the world seem to be at their worst, it's just scratching the surface. It's just the tip of the iceberg. But the beginning of that is what I wanted to share with you. We, uh, as I read here uh, in Matthew 24, between verses 8 and 14, this covers uh, some of the beginning of the tribulation. It talks about persecution. The persecution will take place beforehand as well. Please turn with me to Luke 21. And I'd like to read verses 12 through 19. Luke 21 and verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth of wisdom, which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, for they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated for all, or by all, for my name's sake. But not a hair on your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls." So that first opening scripture describes that persecution is prophesied to take place as well. And it is mostly mentioned in the context of when the fifth seal is opened, which I will not go into. But persecution does not have to wait for that time to begin. It will be widespread eventually, but it, <laughs> we're also warned here that it will take place beforehand too. And we read in several places in the Bible today of early Christians that, uh, who were persecuted for the sake of preaching the gospel. Religious persecution will become more pronounced as that tribulation begins, however. So there will be other uh, events that will occur as well uh, that lead up to the tribulation. 
Uh, going back to Matthew 24, I'd like to read verses 15 through 22. Again, I'm uh, covering what to watch for, things that will happen preceding tribulation. So there are two additional items that I want to talk about. Matthew 24 and verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, uh, to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as, not, such as has not been since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, the abomination of desolation uh, is described in Daniel in greater detail. But that describes the desecration of the temple. What that means is that there has to be a temple. There will be a temple built around the time of the tribulation. Uh, uh, how much uh, beforehand, we don't know. But the, uh, the temple being erected is something that will be required in order for the abomination of the desolation uh, to begin. When exactly the man of sin will occupy that temple is unclear, however. But we do know that these things will mark the beginning of the tribulation, as Jesus Christ describes here. Let's go back to Daniel in verse 11. I'm sorry, chapter 11 and read verse 31. Daniel 11 and verse 31. This describes the king of the north. And forces shall be mustered by him, referring to the king of the north, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation, which we read about uh, in Matthew 24. The king of the north will take away daily sacrifices. That means the king of the north will exist. And the king of the north is also known as the beast, that charismatic political and military leader. That man, the beast, will be active on the world scene around the time that the tribulation begins. That's because he's going to be directly involved in the tribulation coming about. But we also uh, understand from the context here that, uh, that that beast will not come onto the world scene until uh, uh, around this time. He won't uh, be identified as such much before this time. Now, these are the things to watch for, and there are many more as well, and I encourage all of us to study these things. But I wanted to cover some important events that we need to be aware of and how they all fit together. It's easy to get confused if we lose track. We need to make sure that we understand the sequence, and we also need to understand what the defining characteristics are of these events so we aren't fooled when religious deception proliferates around the world. Contradiction will certainly abound. So, uh, summarizing what we can expect to see leading up to the tribulation and as the tribulation begins, religious deception will increase in abundancy and intensity. There will be world war. There will be famine and sickness. We will also be watching for that third temple to come about. And we will also watch for the emergence of that beast. And of course, as I mentioned, there are other events to look into as well. And you can read biblical prophecy from now until forever 
as well as other booklets to, uh, to learn about that. So as scary as these things are, uh, it's, our imaginations can run amok and cause us uh, to get scared. But what are we to do about it? In practical terms, we are here. <laughs> There's very little that we can control, but we are affected by. What are we going to do? It's natural when we understand the disaster of these uh, events to want to do something about it that will protect ourselves, protect our loved ones from harm that inevitably will come. So as we consider in this second part of my message what types of things we are to do, we should ask ourselves what the Bible instructs us to do. Does the Bible instruct us to take protective measures to prepare ourselves against the horrors of war and commotions by buying weapons, building bomb shelters? Is that what we read about? Does the Bible instruct us to prepare ourselves against famine by stockpiling provisions? Does the Bible instruct us to prepare ourselves against sickness and disease epidemics by pumping ourselves full of vaccines and buying land where we can be isolated from an epidemic? Is that what we are supposed to do? I haven't read that. <laughs> and I don't think you have either. It's not in here. But we certainly are instructed to take care of ourselves. We don't want to tempt God. Certainly we uh, want to do our due diligence to uh, take safety measures. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit after all. We wear our safety belts. We don't smoke, for example. But the measures that we are supposed to take to preserve ourselves in this uh, time of the beginning of sorrows, what the Bible instructs us to do is to take measures that are not carnal. The war that we fight is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. In Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13, we read about that. It's about the armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Let's withstand that evil day. Having done all to stand, we have to remember that the struggles that we may face may seem physical because we are affected in physical ways. But it is a spiritual warfare that's taking place. We can take, I'm sorry, we cannot take physical measures to fight against a spiritual onslaught. The way to effectively prepare ourselves is in spirit. That's what we need to do. Any kind of physical preparations will not save us. So how can we effectively prepare ourselves during difficult times that are to come? I've got three things that we'll be uh, able to do. And the first one is to fight deception. So let's turn again back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is getting a workout today. Let's read Matthew 24, beginning in verse 23. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, or uh, do not go out. Or, look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Religious deception is at work in these examples. We need to follow what the Bible says, and it's very plain here. The coming of the Son of Man, of Jesus Christ, will not be a secret. It's going to be seen and noticed around the world. And what is amazing here is Jesus Christ saying, look, I told you so 2,000 years ago. He said he has told us beforehand that people will be deceived. These words are so plain, and people will not get it. Why is that? People love a secret. That's why. We cannot love the secrets because they're sensational or fun to believe. We need to stick to the truth is the point. That is how we protect ourselves against religious deception. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians 2, and we'll read verses 7 through 12. 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning in verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all powers, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And that's the key, is the love of the truth. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. When we don't have the love of the truth, we fall into the risk of becoming deceived. The lawless one here is going to cause a lot of destruction. And the people who don't have the truth in their hearts they're going to fall for the tricks, the lying wonders, the great signs, even though it contradicts the Bible. The pursuit of obtaining the truth is at the heart of every defense against deception. The truth is where we need to stand. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 3, and we'll read verse 17 beginning in verse 17. 2 Timothy 3, verse 17. Hmm. Nope, I think I got that wrong. This is an important scripture. I've got the scripture uh, numbers wrong, but I'm going to read this to you anyway. It's a warning for us. Ah, okay, sorry. It is 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. Sorry about that. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, is written in Timothy here. Now, people who turn to sensational teachings because they are more appealing than the truth, they put themselves in danger. Now, if you listening in, if you are seeking a teacher or a minister who will tantalize you with speculation that's not founded on the truth, then you're in trouble, is what it says here. If you're looking for something that is sounds really interesting and fascinating, 
If you're looking for the secret truth that has not yet been revealed, be warned is what is written here. The truth is written here in the Bible and it hasn't changed. We understand what is to come about. If you tuned into this sermon today, if you're sitting here today and you are disappointed that I didn't share any new secret knowledge about the prophecy of the Bible, you might need to meditate on what you value in the truth. The truth is plainly written here in the Bible. I'm not teaching anything new. I'm not going to. We're warned here against deception to stick to the truth and not heap up for ourselves teachers who sensationalize. Of course, the truth is founded in the Word of God. Let's go back to Ephesians 6 and read verses 17 and 18. Ephesians 6 and verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Part of the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit. It's a weapon, for sure, but it is the word of God. It's not a physical weapon. It is the word of God that gives us the power and control to defend ourselves and fight against deception. And we're instructed to use that in conjunction with prayer. We have to stay close to God as well. So let's go over to uh, Hebrews 4 and read verses 11 and 12. This too is about the two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 and verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Diligence here is mentioned in the pursuit of truth. It is needed. And the truth is sought through understanding and learning about the word of God. Again, we see it described as a sword. It's a weapon against deception. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. This is a warning to you and me. It's a, it's a fearful one. Falling away from the faith is inevitable when we begin to heed teachings that are not founded in the truth of the Bible. I don't want to fall away. I don't think you do either. And sticking uh, in the faith involves sticking to the truth. When people fall away, too, their conscience becomes seared. It becomes useless because they've hardened themselves against believing the truth. Think of those who once we're here with us and uh, now are celebrating secular holidays like Christmas and Easter. They used to believe that it was wrong to do those things, but now they've hardened themselves because they're not sticking to the truth. That's, that's a seared conscience. Our conscience needs to remain tender and founded in the truth. If we want to prepare ourselves to endure the hardship that will come, upon this world, even before the tribulation, we have to make sure to protect ourselves against deception. Deception will do one thing. It leads people away from God. 
If we want to stay close to God and protect ourselves against deception, we must nurture our love for the truth and become intimately familiar with the word of God. So the second thing that we need to do is do the work. Knowing the truth is not enough. We need to follow what is right as well. Again, going back to Matthew 24, uh, let's read verses beginning in verse 45. Matthew 24 and verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, again, giving heed to religious deception, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he will not expect, uh, not aware of, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a clear and direct relationship between doing the work of God, that is being obedient to instructions, and being blessed. And being blessed includes protection. On the other hand, if we are caught off, let me rephrase that, if we decide that we don't need to change anything in our lives, if we decide to continue in a, a way of sin, not really following the instructions that we read in the Bible, we will be caught off guard. What will happen? <laughs> Jesus Christ will return and people will not be ready. Jesus Christ said himself that he, he told us beforehand that this would happen. If we want to be protected in difficult times, we must live by the truth. <clears throat> Let's go to Psalm uh, 119. I'll read verse 1 through 4. David had a lot of wonderful things to say about following and living by the law, and this is one of my favorite passages that he, he writes. Psalm 119 in verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. The way we live is to be in accordance with God's commandments. We are to walk that way, live it day in and day out, every moment of our lives. And our whole heart needs to be committed. We keep the commandments with diligence, really working at the details, not just brushing it off and rounding off the corners. Turn back to Matthew 7, and we'll read verses 24 through 27. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and, and great was its fall. We're instructed to be wise, which involves actually living by and following the commandments of God. Can people do that? Can you do that? Can I do that? We need to work at it, certainly. We need to learn about the truth, but it's not enough. We need to do what we are taught as well. And when we do, what does it say we can expect as a result? Safety, protection against difficult times, 
when the rain beats down, the floods come, we're founded in the truth, locked in at, on a solid foundation. We will not be moved by any deception that comes about if we're founded in the truth. <laughs> There's great protection there. But if we don't, if we decide to learn about the truth and not do it, then we find ourselves defenseless against the hardship that will come. And the third and last thing we need to do in order to protect ourselves against hardship is look to God for protection. To seek the truth and live by it are things we can do actively to protect ourselves. But we must also realize that protection and safety in difficult times is not something that we can directly cause. We are not the source of our own safety. God provides our safety and protection, always. Let's go over to Luke 21 and read verses 35 through 36. Luke 21 and verse 35. Actually, I'll begin in verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come to a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We are to pray. We are to not get caught up in the ways of this world. People who do get caught up in the ways of this world will be trapped. Those lusts of the, of the flesh are distractions. We need to avoid those things in order to be worthy and pray also to God that he will protect us, that we will be worthy to be protected. We can't trust in mankind, in the immense uh, defense of our nations. Let's go back to Psalm 146, read verses 3 and 4. Psalm 146, and verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. When we're looking for protection, making difficult decisions about what to do, we need to be keenly aware of where we are putting our trust. When we make a difficult decision, as hardship uh, is at our door, are we going to be trusting in worldly leaders? Are we going to be trusting in, in man and the plans of men? Or are, on the contrary, are we trusting in God to protect us? We must trust in God. Since we're in Psalm, uh, in Psalms, let's go over to Psalm 28 and read verses 6 and 9, 6 through 9. Psalm 28, and verse 6. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I pray, I will praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is uh, the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. We need to be aware and conscious that the source uh, of our strength and our protection is from God. We trust in him. He provides us with safety. It takes faith, certainly, and it, our faith will be tested, but it is within the capacity of us all to do that. We don't need money. We don't need land. We don't need a master plan, a contingency plan. We need faith, and that is within everybody's grasp. I'll read Nahum 1 in verse 7 through 8 for you. You can turn there if you know how to get to it quick. 
Nahum 1, verse 7 through 8, states this, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. When troubling days come, God offers us protection. But if we are enemies of God, know who the enemies of God are, those ones who live by sin, those enemies will suffer. But those who trust in God, God will be a stronghold to them. Psalm 33 and verse 16 through 22 states this, No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is, in, is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. We cannot be saved by the strength of man. Period. There's nothing that can give us the true safety that we need. But if we fear God, he watches out for us. He offers us protection. So these are the three things we can do. We protect ourselves against religious deception. We practice the truth. And we have faith in God. There's no question that the events that are prophesied to occur on this earth, as I opened up, will be fearsome. They will test all of mankind, forcing everyone on, this face, on the face of this earth to make difficult decisions and sacrifices. I'd like to read one more scripture for you today. This is in Mark 13, verses 32 through 37. Mark 13 and verse 32. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who is who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of his house, of the house, is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. We have some simple instructions to follow that will help us through the hard times that will come. And it begins with Jesus' admonition here. Watch. I went through some of the early events to watch for. That is what we need to be aware of. By ensuring that we have a love for the truth, we can defend ourselves against deception so that we are not led away from God. Certainly, as we are watching events, people will come up with all kinds of crazy theories. Some are going to be really compelling. But if they're not founded in the truth, you have to ignore them. You follow what the Bible says. By doing the work of God, once we understand the truth, in obedience to the law, we will find favor and safety from God. By putting our faith in God for protection, instead of man, we are offered safety. It all boils down, all of this together, into a single strategy. We need to get on God's side in this fight. Truth, obedience, and faith are the means of doing that. Citing the great words written in Romans 8, verse 31, what, sh what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 